Hello Year 10, this is Mr Bell speaking on behalf of the English Department and today we're going to be doing a lesson on Macbeth. Specifically we're going to be focusing on Act 1, Scene 1 of Macbeth. Now we know many of you have studied this before, most classes have, but we think it's really important that we go over things and that we make sure that everyone has the same bank of knowledge. So you're going to be getting a lesson on every scene from Act 1 of Macbeth in the next couple of weeks and there is a task sheet for you to complete as you go. Right, let's get started. So that was a great version of the play there, and your first job is to summarise it. Summarise the scene in 20 words or fewer. Pause this please and come back to me in two minutes when you're completed. So the opening to Macbeth is a really short scene, but it's a very atmospheric scene, a very effective scene. We've usually got all sorts of spooky noises going on. Of course, we've got the witches who themselves are quite supernatural and scary. Shakespeare immediately tells us that there's thunder and lightning in the scene. And by opening with the witches in this short but very atmospheric scene, he's creating a eerie, spooky atmosphere for the rest of the play. Particularly, of course, as you've probably had mentioned to you in your lessons, for this man here. For King James the Sixth of Scotland, who by this stage had become James the First of England, and he'd only been king for a few years. James the First, as you know, was terrified of witches. He was obsessed by them, he hunted them, he was a witch finder general himself, and his behaviour led to the death of hundreds of innocent people, mostly women, as a result of his terror of witches. So Shakespeare's really pandering to King James's interests here. It's going to hook the king, and who better to hook than uh, the most powerful person in the country. Now we're going to focus as well on the important aspects of language within this play. And one thing to notice straight away within this is the semantic field of the weather. We have the stage directions, thunder and lightning. The first witch mentions, in thunder, lightning, or in rain. The third witch refers to the set of sun. Probably obviously a reference to the start of night time when witches really come to life. And the, play, the scene ends with all three witches speaking together in that spooky way they do with, hover through the fog and filthy air. The reference to fog and filthy air. Oh, coupled with thunder, lightning, rain, set of sun, thunder and lightning again, all create a semantic field of the weather. Now a semantic field is a group of words linked by a similar topic. And this semantic field of the weather helps to create a sense of pathetic fallacy when the weather reflects the mood. Pathetic fallacy when the weather reflects the mood. Shakespeare does this in order to create a really tense, scary opening to his play. There are also really interesting things happening within the witch's language. Not just the use of the weather, but actually the rhyming patterns that they use. You'll notice the first witch. When shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning or in rain? So again in rain, creating a rhyme. The second witch rhymes too. When the hairy bear is done, when the battle's lost and won, third witch joins in, that will be ere the set of sun. Done, won, and sun. Shakespeare immediately hits us with a strong sense of rhyme here from the characters. When characters speak in rhyme in Shakespeare, it's usually a sign of something being not quite right. It's often used as a sense of the supernatural. And that's perfect for this, isn't it? The witch is speaking in the supernatural language. 
but I want you to keep a track of rhyme, particularly rhyming couplets throughout the play, because I think rhyming couplets can also be a sign of insanity. Particularly if you look at Macbeth, as his character develops and he becomes more of a tyrant as the play goes on, notice how his language um, encompasses an awful lot more rhyme than it previously had done. Just before he kills King Duncan, he says, It is a knell, here at, uh, sorry, when the bell rings, he says, Here and not Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven, nor to hell. And once he is king, he speaks in an awful lot more rhyming couplets, kind of connecting him with evil, with the supernatural, with the witches. Shakespeare also makes use of trochaic tetrameter. Well, that's a complicated word. Trochaic tetrameter. Effectively, what we've got here are more or less eight syllable lines of poetry with a stressed syllable and then an unstressed syllable. So creating a baboom, 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 baboom effect. So the first line could read, When shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain when the hurly burly's done? Okay, it creates a really unnatural sense from the witches. It's actually meant to echo the sense of a heartbeat, which might make everything seem a little bit more mortally dangerous, mightn't it? But it also further emphasises the unnatural nature of the witches. They're the only characters in the play who speak in this trochaic tetrameter. The other characters, the noble characters in Macbeth, will speak in longer lines. What's something that we'll later uh, deal with called iambic pentameter, where the rhythm and the stress is a little bit different. So it marks the witches as being different and lower down in society and somehow evil. The rhyme and the trochaic tetrameter create those effects really well. The third thing I want to talk about in the play is Shakespeare's use of paradox. Now, a paradox is a statement that seems self-contradictory. It can't make sense together. Some of the examples you can see in the left there in the blue box. I must be cruel to be kind. Well, how can you be cruel to be kind? And Shakespeare, of course, uses this in one of the most famous lines he ever wrote at the very end of this scene. Fair is foul and foul is fair. Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? You can't be both fair and foul. And it can't be that foul is then fair. So what Shakespeare is really commenting on here is the nature, the untrustworthy nature of people and how they are not what they seem. The witches have a really good understanding of this. They know that fair, possibly meaning Macbeth, the hero at the start of the play, is also foul. They know his, the evil within him. But then on the flip side, what's evil can also be good. So the witches have this really unnatural sense of understanding of the world and evil, which makes them really creepy and spooky. But I think one of the creepiness and spookiness of the witches really comes about because of their intelligence, their understanding of the world. And of course, this line, fair is fair is foul and foul is fair, is even more effective come the end of the play. Sorry, no, come the, uh, the start of the third scene, not the end of the play. Come to start the third scene where Macbeth will speak for the first time and the first thing he will say is, So foul and fair a day I have not seen. So the first time we meet Macbeth, he's speaking almost in parallel with the witch's language. It's too uncannily similar to be a coincidence. Okay, so you should have now a summary of the scene. You should have written about the importance of this scene. You should also then have notes on, which is going to go back, notes on semantic field of weather and pathetic fallacy, rhyming language, trochaic tetrameter, paradox, the witch's paradox there, fair as foul and foul as fair. What you can do for an extension is click this link here. I will also include in the email and watch as the excellent Mr. Salas talks about the importance of Act 1, Scene 1 to the rest of the play. Okay, complete that work, please, and send that to your English teacher for checking. If you have any questions, please use Teams. Email your teacher directly or use Teams. If you've got any questions about actually this particular video, you're welcome to contact me, phil.bell at whitleybayhighschool.org. Okay, I hope you found that useful. There'll be another 10-minute video coming for Act 1, Scene 2 in a short while.